In the name of Jesus, I speak to you today. Amen. Well, as you know, every week we confess our faith using the words of one of the ancient Christian creeds. In one of those creeds, we say this, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. One baptism. Now, you might pick up on a little bit of passion from me today. Um, you might even pick up a little anger, a little frustration, because I'm going to be talking about an issue that, well, I'm frustrated about, and I am a little angry about it, because there are people in Waverly, Nebraska, that are messing with God's salvation. And when anybody messes with God's salvation, they need to be brought to the truth, and they need to, be, they need to repent of messing with God's salvation. Let me explain. There are people in Nebraska that I hear that are doing that, and they're being told that their baptism is not good enough. People have trusted in Jesus Christ since they were babies are now being manipulated, persuaded to get re-baptized. Why is that? They're being told, in effect, that you need to take some of the glory for your own salvation. This is called decision theology, that you've got to make a decision, and by doing that, you get some of the glory for your salvation. For them, baptism is not what God does for you, as we know the Bible says. For them, baptism is what you do for God, and that's nothing less than idolatry. And you can't do that as a baby, they say. Well, I beg to differ, and today I'm going to show you how the Bible begs to differ as well. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Who said this statement? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Does anybody remember who said that? Peter said that on the day of Pentecost, for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, earlier we heard about Jesus being baptized, and you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. Jesus is the sinless Son of God. Why would he need to be baptized if baptism is for the forgiveness of your sins? Well, notice even John the baptizer in a different um, gospel says, no, no, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. John's even objecting because he knows that Jesus is, is sinless. Well, here's the deal. Jesus receives the baptism not to forgive his sins, but to stand in your place. Jesus would receive baptism that is meant for sinners because he would be the sin bearer. He is the Lamb of God who bears the sin of the whole world, who takes the sin of the world away. Let me ask you, does Jesus need your help to take your sins away? No, he doesn't. All glory goes to God. No glory goes to us. So let me ask you, you might be asking, well, what is baptism then? Why is it important? What is, does it do? Baptism is the way that God connects you to the saving works of his son, Jesus Christ. This slide here shows that his baptism pointed towards his, his death and resurrection, which you then are connected to in your baptism. You are united into Jesus' death. You are united into his resurrection. In fact, that's the way it works. In fact, would you please read the next verse up on the slide here with me? Ready? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. That's why it's, this is a big deal. Jesus paid the penalty of death for your sins, and Jesus resurrected to conquer death. And that's all great. And you're thinking, oh yeah, I have heard that for all my life. Good. But how does that forgiveness, how does that work of the cross and out of the grave get to people? How does that come to you? Well, we've always said the word and the sacraments, the word and the sacraments. God uses the word and the sacraments, baptism, to bring the work of Jesus to that person. Do you see why baptism is important? Paul clearly says that baptism connects us to his resurrection. That's how it saves us. That means that baptism does something to us. It's a huge deal. We don't first connect ourselves and take glory for it. 
That's what God has done for us. As Paul said in another place, we are clothed with Jesus Christ. We put on Christ when we are baptized. Look at that verse here. It says, were baptized. Passive. It does not say, as many of you have made a decision to follow Jesus, have put on Christ. It doesn't say, as many of you have accepted Christ, put on Christ. It doesn't say, as many of you have walked down front to the altar call and said the sinner's prayer, have put on Christ. No, it says, as many of you were baptized, have put on Christ. In fact, we cannot even claim God as our own. As we are born, even as we are conceived, we are born blind to God, dead in our trespasses and sins. We are actually, from the moment of our conception, hostile enemies of God. So how can we then just say, if we're born blind, dead, hostile enemies of God, say, I just now want to believe in God? We can't, and you want to know why? In fact, look at these verses. In fact, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. In the second verse, no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Brothers and sisters, we can't even be a Christian unless the Holy Spirit's working on us and he's the one that brings us to faith. So why would anybody take credit for their salvation and say, well, you've got to believe first. You've got to accept him. It's only a decision, they say. They take some of the credit for their salvation, which is due only to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, there are folks here in Waverly who are now pushing folks to get rebaptized, And those who are are getting it backwards. They're taking some of the glory for their salvation that is due to God alone. All glory goes to God None to us. So what about babies? And what about baptism? Did you know that I've actually been told, back in Indiana, I was told, I remember I was at a wedding reception, this guy came up to me and asked me about my faith. And I said, well, I have always known Jesus as my Savior. There has never been a time that I can remember that I didn't know that Jesus was my Savior. And I go, I gotta tell you, I'm a born-again Christian. I was born again when I was two weeks old. He goes, doesn't work that way. You're not saved. I beg your pardon? Nope. There's got to be a time when you were 9, 10, 11, 12, when you you consciously, rationally decided to follow Jesus, accepted Christ. And I asked, what about someone who is severely mentally handicapped? He said, well, we would never baptize them. What? I'm not kidding. They would withhold the beautiful gift of God because someone can't rationally, intelligently understand it. I'm like, guess what? We can't rationally, intelligently understand it anyway. The Holy Spirit is the one that helps us to trust it through faith. Look about this. Even starting with the command to repent. We see from God's word that repentance is something that God gives. Look at this next verse. God exalted Jesus at the right hand to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. The next verse. To the Gentiles, God has also granted, granted repentance that leads to life. Even bringing repentance to repentance is something that God does and he gets the glory for it. Another reason we baptize babies and adults is because Christ and the apostles commanded it. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, he commanded his disciples, go and make disciples, baptizing them. All nations. Do you know the Bible doesn't say anything about, well, baptize, make sure you baptized older folk Well, yeah, of course. He doesn't say, make sure you baptize teenagers. Well, yeah, of course. And he doesn't say in the Bible, well, make sure you baptize babies because they're included in all nations. All nations includes all people of all ages. You know, it's always funny when people say, you show me one place in the Bible where it says to baptize children. I say, you show me one place where it says to take your children to church, to worship. It doesn't. You know why? Why? Because the people of God have always included children. God has always included children in the cov- his covenant people. And they've always worshipped at the tabernacle or at synagogues and the temple. There was no reason for God to say, oh, by the way, now start taking your kids to church. They were like, yeah, we've been doing that for thousands of years. And there was no reason why they would say, Jesus would say, now start baptizing your babies. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. Because they had already been doing it for hundreds of years that in a minute, little bit. 
Just one verse after Peter said, repent and be baptized on Pentecost, Peter said this, this promise is for you and your children. Now, some people say, well, that's just mean that it's descendants. I'm like, well, first of all, that's a contrary to the actual words of the text, clear reading of the text. Second of all, nowhere in the Bible does it say that baptism is given to certain family lines. You mean that's just for these people and our descendants? No, no. It's for us and our children who we have authority over right now. They misunderstand this. The Holy Spirit is for all people. Baptism is for all people of all ages. Forgiveness of sins is for all people. All glory to God, none to us. Next, we baptize babies because babies are sinful and in need of salvation. I know we live in a culture that says people are born innocent and then they're taught to hate. They're taught to be bad. No, well, they might have been taught to hate, but they were, they were not perfect. They were not sinless in the birth. We are all born sinful and in need of a savior. In fact, look at these verses right here. It'll just tell you. And some will say, well, now there's an age of accountability. When, you know, maybe age 9 to 11, 12, then people actually become accountable for the sins that they commit, but not before. And I'm like, have you read the Bible? It's from the moment of our conception that we are already accountable for our sinfulness. Already at the moment of our conception, we need a savior and we need to be connected to him. Let me say this. To deny infant baptism is to deny original inherited sin. You can't, there's no two ways about it. Because they're saying, well, these kids, they're not age of accountability, so they're not responsible for their sins or their sinfulness. I'm like, but they have original sin that's been given to them, inherited them from their parents all the way back to Adam and Eve. It doesn't make any sense. But people are so wrapped up in their decision theology that I get to claim some of my, my salvation for myself. They're not willing to listen to learn to understand. To deny that is to deny original sin. And here's the good news. The Bible says, baptism now saves you. How does it? It saves us by connecting us to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, it makes me sad when I see Lutherans leave this church, leave the Lutheran church, or leave the church total, and then they prevent their kids from having the beautiful gift of baptism. I think it even makes me sadder when I hear of people, Christians who've known Jesus Christ since they were time that they were babies, be manipulated and persuaded into thinking that they need to be re-baptized because the first one didn't take or the promises of God are unsure. Very sad. We go on. We baptize baby because it replaces circumcision. God made a covenant with Abraham, the old covenant, and he said this, this is my covenant you shall keep between you and me, your offspring. Every male among you shall be circumcised. It shall be the sign of the covenant. Well, once Jesus was, as the Messiah came, it's no longer need the old covenant. In the new covenant, the New Testament, Paul teaches us this. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism. So baptism now is the sign of the new covenant. It's for all people. See, there was no need for Christ Jesus to say, oh, by the way, start baptizing kids now because babies have always been part of the covenant people of God. In the Old Testament, on the eighth day, eight-day-old baby boys were circumcised and they representing their sisters. They were always, babies have always been part of the covenant people of God and so they are today as well. What's the sign of the covenant now? Baptism. You see, back in the day, there were, prior to Jesus' birth, about 300 years before Jesus' birth, the Jews were getting very missionary-minded. And they said, you know, the way they made non-Jews Jews was through circumcision and through baptism or ritualistic cleansings. Jews believed that baptisms washed away the paganism off of these Gentiles, and they were born again as new children of the covenant, as new Jews, they would walk down into these water pools called mikvahs. They would walk down a pagan, go through the water, and walk out as a covenant Jew, a covenant person of God. You see, here's what's interesting. Whole families would go down into this water together. Whole families also with babies in arms. 
So if Jesus would have said on the Great Commission, said, oh, 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 by the way, before I forget, you need to start baptizing babies too, the people would have gone, uh, yeah, we've been baptizing babies for 300 years. There's no need for that anymore. We baptize babies because, as this verse says, babies can have faith. Upon you I've leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust me, you at my mother's breast. Babies can have faith. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, and his mother said the baby leaped for joy as she was inspired by the Holy Spirit to say that. John knew that he was in the presence of Jesus even in his mother's womb. And now here's another one. Now they were bringing infants to him, to Jesus, that he might touch them. The disciples rebuked the parents, but Jesus said, let them come to me. Don't hinder them. For to such, for to these infants belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Follow this. Since baptism is the way that sins are forgiven and the Holy Spirit is given, therefore baptism says, as the Bible says it does, baptism is for children as we see, then baptism is the way that God creates saving faith in a child. All glory to God, no glory to us. We baptize babies because Christ's apostles baptize babies. How do we know? Whole households were baptized. Lydia's household was baptized. You see that? Her whole household. The Philippian jailer's household was baptized. The household of Stephanus was baptized by Paul himself. And back then especially, their households included children. All glory to God, no glory to us. We baptize babies because the early church continued to baptize babies. How do we know this? John was the oldest living apostle of Jesus. And you may not have known this, but disciples of Jesus also had disciples of their own. Well, one of John's disciples was a guy named Polycarp. Funny name, I know, but Polycarp was his name. He lived from 69 AD to 155 AD. And here's what Polycarp said right before he was martyred for being a Christian. 80 and six years have I served the Lord Christ. Would you add up 69, 155, how much, how many, how, what, what would that be? 86 years. So he lived 86 years. He says he was 86 years that he has served the Lord Christ. How can that be? How could he serve the Lord Christ as an infant? Baptism. This is only, this is 69 he was, 69 AD, that's only about 40 years after Jesus it gave the great commission to baptize all nations. The early church was very clear <laughs> that baptism, that way Jesus taught it and the apostles did it, was for infants as well. Well, Polycarp had a, um, had a disciple and his name was Irenaeus. And here's what Irenaeus said just a little bit later. All who through him are born again to God, infants and children, boys and youth and old men. They all came to him through the saving means. All who through him are born again to God, infants. And another early church father by the name of Origen, just a little later, said this. The church had from the apostles a tradition to give baptism to infants. When they say tradition, they mean traditio. It doesn't mean like it's let's make it up as a custom, fun thing to do. Traditio in the Latin means it's been practiced and handed down to us. A tradition to baptize even infants. Infants are to be baptized for the forgiveness, remission, of sins. Archaeologists have found tombstones that show that the early church continued the practice of baptism of babies just as Jesus commanded. In a Roman tomb in 200 AD, we see a grandmother wanted her grandson who was sick to die as a believer, so she wanted him baptized. Presumably, the father named Florentius was not a Christian. Look at this tombstone and the how it reads. So his dad's name is Florentius. Click one more time, would you? Dedicated to the departed, Florentius made this inscription for his worthy son, Apronianus, who lived one year and nine months and five days, as he truly loved by his grandmother, as she knew that his death was coming, imminent, she asked that the church, that he, asked the church that he might depart from this world as a believer, as one-year-old. How did you do that? Through baptism because they baptized infants back then. And there are many church such, such tombstones that show, that prove that in the earliest of church, infant baptism was happening. There was only one guy in the early Christian church 
He was a teacher by the name of Tertullian that said otherwise. Tertullian mistakenly thought that baptism um, forgave your sins up to that point, but not later. So he actually preached, don't get baptized until your deathbed. So then all your sins are forgiven. Because you see, Tertullian didn't understand that in our baptisms, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit poured out on us for the rest of our lives. All glory to God and none to us. And I'm almost done. After Tertullian was declared wrong by the church, everything was pretty good for about 1,300 years. But around 1520, a guy named Thomas Munzer, who was a real, he, he, he rejected all types of authority, all types of authority, including church authority. He was trying to make a name for himself, in my opinion. Thomas Munzer started the Anabaptist movement, which means re-baptism. And in Switzerland and Germany and Holland started it. This movement gained steam. And even though the church understood from the time of Jesus and the apostles that baptism was for children as well, for infants as well, for 1,500 years, when he got to there, he gained so much steam with this that the anti-infant baptism movement started so well in Europe. And when those Europeans came to America, and as you know, it is alive and well in the United States of America. And this decision theology, anti-infant baptism is alive and well in Waverly, Nebraska. I am sad to report that it is. Thomas Munzer would like me to take some of the glory for my own salvation. I won't do that because the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible gives all glory to God for my salvation. I didn't choose him because the Bible says he chose me. And he chose me on December 19th, 1965 at Zion Lutheran Church in New Palestine, Indiana. That's the day that I was baptized into Jesus' death and into his resurrection. And to say that I had anything to do with my salvation is nothing less than idolatry. I wouldn't be giving some of the glory for myself, to myself for my salvation. Uh-uh. I won't take any of the glory for my salvation because all glory goes to God. None of it goes to me. Brothers and sisters, as your friends start to talk about being rebaptized, would you please send the link of this video to them today? If they're gonna do it, they're gonna do it. But at least then they've had this, this scriptural evidence and even early church evidence to show that even from the time of Jesus and the apostles, they knew. Would you please send that link for this video that they could at least watch it before they make this mistake, as if their first baptism, God didn't make it take? Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River for me and in my place. Jesus was baptized for you in your place. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, my sins and your sins. Our salvation is God's doing, not ours. May we never claim glory for it, and may we always confess until the day that we die, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. Let us pray. Lord God, we praise you for salvation that is a gift to us. Lord, when we find our brothers and sisters in Christ messing with it and trying to say that we should claim part of it for ourselves, we ask you, Lord, to help us to speak the truth in love, seasoned with salt, full of grace, but help us to speak the truth nonetheless. And Lord, we ask you to bring all of the decision theology to an end. Help everyone in your church worldwide to realize that all glory goes to you, none to us. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.